Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Jonathan Marks. He is Professor of Anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. His primary training is in Biological Anthropology and Genetics. In 2006, he was elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2012, he, he was awarded the first Citizens Bank Scholars Medal from UNC Charlotte. In recent years, he has been a visiting research fellow at the ESRC Genomics Forum in Edinburgh and at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and the Templeton Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Notre Dame. Dr. Marx is skeptical of genetic explanations of human behavior, of race as a biological category, and of science as a rationalistic endeavor. Is the author of books like The Alternative Introduction to Biological Anthropology, Tales of Ex Apes, and Is Science Racist? So, I guess that we will have very interesting topics to explore here today and some of them are a bit controversial. So Dr. Marx, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice talking to you. Okay, great. So, I mean, it's interesting. I invited you on the show because you have some uh, very strong criticisms of aspects of how we do anthropology and even science more generally that are not really mainstream. I mean, they really run counter to the mainstream in many ways. So the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, when studying anthropology and particularly disciplines like uh, paleoanthropology and biological anthropology because we're trying to reconstruct our evolutionary history and past. Uh, one of the criticisms that you make is that we are trying to create a, a sort of an origin story and you say that that might contaminate how we do science in those disciplines. Is that correct and why? Um, well, of course, what we do in science, especially the science of, of human origins, is tell stories about it. Yeah. And the stories are different uh, are, are different from the stories that other societies tell. All cultures tell stories about who they are and where they came from. Um, we tell scientific stories, and consequently, I think, we have to understand what the constraints of a scientific story are that are different from the stories that other people tell. Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that we contaminate um, the science by telling origin stories. I would say that telling stories is, is implicit in every scientific endeavor. Um, you know, if we have any biological imperatives at all, it's language. Um, so everything we do in science involves language. It involves metaphors. It involves figures of speech. Um, and that involves linguistic storytelling. Um, so I'm interested in figuring out just what the specific constraints of scientific origin stories are that are different from other kinds of origin stories. I mean, some people believe that they sprang from the earth. Some people believe that they, um, uh, uh, you know, came from, from mother corn spirit. Um, we happen to believe that we descended from monkeys and apes over the course of millions of years. Um, so I'm interested in why do we believe that and how is that kind of a story and, and there are many stories, many scientific origin stories, um, that all fall within certain constraints of how you make a scientific story that's different from any other kind of story. Um, uh, what makes a story scientific as opposed to unscientific? Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, by the way, could you tell us that what makes a story scientific 
instead of just, a, for example, an origin story that different cultures around the world might have and might create. Because uh, that bit is important, even though there's that narrative aspect, even in science, there's still a difference. Sure. Um, well, we have certain constraints, for example, naturalism. Um, you know, th these are things that arose in the late 1600s in European philosophical thought. Um, but the idea that we can separate the natural world of laws and processes from the supernatural world of miracles and magic. And our stories are going to focus only on the natural realm and separate out the supernatural realm. So that, that's one kind of uh, constraint. Um, another is empiricism. Um, we try to let the data show the way um, and base our stories on on uh, the data that are available and and have um, and not all kinds of data will do. You know, we want we want controlled data. Um, and uh, very often, you know, laboratory data tend to be more strongly valued um, than than just sort of going out and looking at the looking at the trees. Um, and um, uh, you know, we also have the idea that accuracy is the most important goal of our scientific story. Um, we don't care if it rhymes. We don't care if it makes you feel good about your place in the universe. Um, these are, uh, we, we don't care if it, if it bonds you to society. Well, these are all things that are important in other kinds of societies and other kinds of origin narratives, um, but they constrain what a scientific story um, uh, has to do. Um, so so in, in that sense, scientific stories are stories, uh, but they're stories within a certain framework um, of, you know, what we would now call philosophy of science. Um, it, it, it's not easy to demarcate where science ends and something else begins. That, that's, in philosophy of science, it's called the demarcation problem. Um, but we do recognize that, you know, if you're talking about spirits and angels, you're not talking about science. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I guess that also one of the problems here, because we are talking about our human e origins and evolutionary history, isn't it the fact also that there are several limitations in studying that also because there are also, there are always missing links, missing bits, missing information, uh, I mean, just over the last 100 and so years or 200 years, people have been little by little uncovering new uh, hominin species and trying to create some sort of uh, lineage, let's say. So it starts with this species and it ends in Homo sapiens or something like that. So, I mean, one of the problems there is this missing information that we can't know about until we get accidentally most of the time in touch with it. Do, do you think that if we didn't add that, if we had a complete, a, a complete account of our evolutionary history, that maybe we could remove the story slash narrative bit of it? Um. No, I don't think so. And for a very important reason, when you deal with fossils, the fossils, first of all, don't come with labels. So you're the one who has to decide, you know, what they are. And the second thing that they don't come with is they, they don't tell you what they're descended from and what they're ancestral to. So you're all, as a scientist, you're the one who's always connecting the dots into a phylogenetic framework. Um, so in that sense, we could have a complete fossil record, but we would still be arguing about whether this fossil is ancestral to that one or it's a dead end and is a cousin you know, of, of the later one. I think the bottom line is that you're always finding fossil samples that are 
you know, one's a little bit later than the other, and it looks a little bit different. So you're the one that essentially draws the line connecting them. Um, but that line is an inference. Um, I, I don't think it's possible to ever get uh, all of the, you know, all of the fossil ancestors in, in a single sequence, because, at very least because you'd have to be working in the same place uh, continuously for and, and looking at, you know, a million year sequence, which I think is going to be uh, pretty much impossible. Um, and of course, there are the constraints of fossilization. It's very hard um, to become a fossil, uh, and, and it's even harder to be found uh, by a paleontologist. So a lot of the actual endeavor of, of coming up with a narrative of our ancestry um, involves thinking really hard about the fossils that we have and trying to make sense of them. That's the creative aspect of science. And, and it strikes me that there's a popular idea about science that it doesn't involve thinking and it doesn't involve creativity. It, it's just sort of going out there and letting nature speak to you. Um, and of course, that's just false. That's not the way it works. Yeah, and I think that also leads us to the question of how we classify different hominin species, right? Because it's not that there's um, a, um, a set of traits or a set of approaches that we have at hand that all people agree with that really allows for us to strictly distinguish one specific species from the other and even the criteria that we come up with they are i mean we could call them artificial right well um what what i would say you know there are all these names out there there homo sapiens homo naledi homo erectus homo georgicus um homo uh uh, uh, uh gosh uh, yeah, uh, there's a whole list of them and, and every person working in the field um, takes some of them with a grain of salt and some of them they work with. Um, now, you can ask, why is it that we have all of these weird names out there, um, which we don't seem to find in related fields? I mean, there's always going to be some dispute over the taxonomy in, in any uh, group of animals. But with humans, we're doing something a little bit different, namely that we're playing with our ancestors. And it's a, I think it's a generalization you can make anthropologically that ancestors are always sacred. And I don't mean sacred in the sense of holy. I mean sacred just in the sense of special. They're, they're just not ordinary. Yeah. Um, and so when you work with human ancestors, you're working with issues of national pride. So you've got, you know, Homo antecessor in Spain, um, and you've got Homo georgicus in Georgia, you've got Homo naledi in South Africa. Um, and what that does is, of course, it democratizes the whole process of science. It makes certain fossils more important, certain countries more important, certain uh, uh, individual curators more important. Um, Back in 1945, the, the great mammalian paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson, whom I got to know a little when I was in graduate school, um, was working on a classification of the entire class mammalia. And when he got to the human, you know, to the human lineage, he was very frustrated that he couldn't make sense of it. Um, and the reason was you had, you know, he thought that as an expert in mammalian species, he should be able to make sense of the species that people were talking about in the human lineage. Um, and what he discovered is that he couldn't, and, and he couldn't for some very interesting reasons. Uh, he, he assumed that he was dealing with incompetent taxonomy and incompetent biology, and he didn't realize he wasn't dealing with taxonomy and biology at all. He was dealing with stories of the sacred ancestors. And once you realize that you're not dealing with ordinary biology, but special biology, biology of our ancestry, um, then you realize that the rules are a little bit different. And, and that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, some people talk about homo soloensis, 
and other people have no idea what that even means. And some people look at homo soloensis and say, ah, you're using a name that's actually just a place marker for certain fossils that are in Indonesia that are uh, that have just been recently dated um, uh, to, I think, about 120,000 years um, and that are anatomically in between Homo erectus that was a little earlier and Homo sapiens that's a little later. But nobody believes that Homo soloensis is a unique, distinct evolutionary lineage um, whose name represents the equivalent of, you know, Drosophila melanogaster, you know, or, or some other ordinary biological species. Um, and the problem is when you start confusing them, right? Because if, if you're confusing these sacred ancestors with species, with familiar species of fruit flies and, and cave bears and things like that, that's when it becomes impossible to make sense of. Mm -hmm. So this concept of or this idea that we have of ancestry is something that might influence the way we think about our own evolution well uh, the stories that we tell about evolution are stories of our ancestry absolutely um and um you know there are people who have difficulty uh, accepting that apes are their ancestors um but, you know, when you encounter those people, at some point you just have to go, okay, if you don't believe that these similarities reflect descent, then what do you think they represent? You know, why is it that a chimpanzee's DNA matches human DNA at, you know, 99% of, of the bases? Um, you know, if it doesn't reflect common ancestry, tell me what it does reflect. And then they usually keep quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and throw the Bible at <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what about the concept of kinship because we also have these in our human societies exactly. does that also reflect on how we think and do science of human evolution well kinship is the oldest research program in anthropology. It was in the 19th century that anthropologists going out to other societies realized that something as natural as relatedness, as relatives, were thought about very differently in different societies. And um, the big question, especially for early British anthropologists, was to figure out how people make sense of their place in the world through their relatives and they do it differently in, in each place. Um, and I think that's a microcosm of what we're trying to do in human evolution. I mean, we're talking about chimpanzees as our relatives, and what we're doing is developing a theory of kinship um, that you know, aligns us with the rest of the species on the planet Earth. And um, a, a lot of scientists are now thinking about kinship to other species in a much more global and ecological sense um, than they had earlier in, in earlier decades. Um, and interestingly, there's a, a, I know a bunch of Christian theologians um, who are working on the same question. How, how do you live a good Christian life um, in a post-Darwinian world in which you are genetically related to other species and descended from common ancestors. I think it's a very interesting theological question as well as a scientific one. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's get into the issue of race. Do you think that there's any way for the concept of race to have any scientific basis? And if not, why not? A hundred years ago, Scientists assumed that the human species came naturally divisible into a fairly small number of fairly discrete, fairly homogeneous clusters, and they called those races. Um, and you know, this goes back a hundred years further, you know, to Linnaeus, um, who didn't use the word race but called them subspecies. At any rate, um, over the course of the 20th century. 
more empirical studies showed that the human species really doesn't come that way. So the question is, um, if the human species doesn't come divisible naturally into a fairly small group of fairly homogeneous uh, people, how does it come? And we now recognize that the patterns of human variation are quite different from that. If you look at human diversity, the thing that's going to strike you most fundamentally is the cultural differences. I mean, how people dress, how people groom themselves, what language they speak. And we know that that stuff isn't biological, but that's the stuff that distinguishes one group of people from its neighbors. If you ignore the cultural differences, for some perverse reason, um, and decide to focus only on the biological differences, well, what do you find? What you find is that the biggest differences are developmental. It, there's, there's a huge impact of where you live and the conditions of life upon your body. Um, and, uh, you know, we would now call these epigenetic. Uh, years ago, they were just calling it developmental. Well, if you ignore that um, and just focus on the genetic differences, Okay, so we're going to ignore the major differences in culture, the major differences in development. We're just going to focus on the genetic differences. What you find is that most variations are found everywhere. Um, Richard Lewinton showed in 1972, classic paper, that most uh, genetic, most detectable genetic variation in the human species is polymorphic or cosmopolitan. Nearly every group has nearly every variant, up to 85, 90, 90% of it. Okay, let's say you ignore that. We're going to ignore the cultural, the developmental, and the polymorphic. What do you find? Well, what you find is that people vary gradually across geography. We call that pattern clinal. Okay, ignore those four variations. What do you find? Um, what's left is local variation. There's no climate of Africa. I mean, Africa is a very big place. Um, so what you find is that people are locally adapted to their environments and local can, can be taken in, in, in many senses, but certainly not continental. So we just don't find uh, biological clusters that represent these continental sort of groupings. Now, um, so what we did over the, over the late 20th century was to separate um, the study of race from the study of human variation. Okay. Um, and race is going to be studied by people interested in discrimination, in law, in colonialism, in genocide, those, and, and those are sort of humanistic disciplines. Human variation is going to be studied scientifically by geneticists, by anatomists, and that's the way it's, it's sorted out. The interesting place where they come together um, is that if you live in a society, you know, obviously race is about classification, um, and it's important in a culture where people aren't equal, where people are discriminated uh, on the basis of how they get classified. And it turns out now that, you know, we've shown that there is an important effect of discrimination upon how the body develops. Um, so, for, so there are biological consequences of race, even though race itself isn't the biological pattern that's out there. So, for example, in the United States, um, if you're black, your life expectancy is three or four years shorter than if you're white. That's certainly not genetic. Um, so clearly what it's about is living in a culture of discrimination and a culture of, of racism that's independently of the biological patterns in the human species. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to what you call the science of human variation, so, so it still admits that there were different groups or populations of people that evolved under different selective pressures throughout the world and that's also why we get some phenotypic variation across different populations i mean we can use the term population in a scientifically rigorous way instead of race right i i, 
Well, population actually is a very sloppy term, I think, in science, um, but it's certainly um, much more, I, I think it's pref preferable to race because race has a lot of 19th century baggage. Um, but population is a term that's notoriously difficult to define uh, rigorously. Um, but at least, you, you know, generally you're working with local groups of people um, rather than an imaginary continent-wide sort of, um, uh, say, selective pressure. Um, selective pressures are um, certainly present in human evolution, but I think one of the most important things to appreciate in human evolution is that over the course of the last couple of hundred thousand years, um, we are far more... Uh, we're adapting far more culturally than biologically. There is biological adaptation to be sure, but it's certainly dwarfed by the ways in which people adapt to their circumstances culturally. Mm -hmm. And the ways by which culture influences us, are you also considering the phenomenon of gene culture coevolution? that is the ways by which our cultural environments might themselves uh, impose new selective pressures on our genetic evolution, or are you only talking about culture separately? Um, you know, most of what we hear about gene culture evolution um, doesn't have a lot of empirical basis. It's, it's a lot of, well, this might be the case. Here's an interesting hypothesis. Um, but it's very rare that the interesting hypothesis turns out to be true. Um, so gene cultural evolution generally involves sort of imaginary genes and real culture. Um, so, uh, you know, there are, there are certainly some issues, you know, you can, you can deal with, with sickle cell anemia um, culturally and, and genetically. But it's a very small, you know, even the even just the genetic adaptations that we are now talking about um, that have been detected in the human genome, you know, there's like 20 of them at, at tops, um, including things like uh, you know lactase uh, uh, lactase insufficiency, which I suffer from, um, and a few other things. But there are very very few examples that we can detect even now of genetic adaptations in uh, the human species. Um, some of them may be adaptive. We have nice adaptive stories for skin color, um, which may be true. Um, but there are other ways, of course, in which the human body varies. For example, the, the width of your nose varies geographically. We don't have an adaptive story for that, or, or we don't have a good one. Um, so a lot of aspects of um, diversity in human form um, may just be random variation. Mm -hmm. And do you think that at the level of behavior and psychology that culture mm -hmm. and cultural evolution uh, trumps genetic evolution? I mean, do you think that most of human psychology and behavior comes from culture instead of being uh, genetically, I didn't want to say determined, but genetically based, perhaps. Yeah, well, I'm not quite sure. I'm not, yeah, again, it's hard to know what the difference is, um, but let's try a thought experiment here. Okay. Okay? Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I think human behavioral genetics has no validity. But what I'm interested in is what is the scope of the relevance of, of behavioral genetics to understanding human behavior. So let's say that um, uh, you have in, in Portugal um, a, a, a gene with a major effect on behavior and personality. Let's say it, it makes you really happy. Okay, you've got a happy gene. Okay, and then um, there's a Yanomamo in Brazil um, that has the same allele, makes them happy. Okay, makes them super happy. Aside from the fact that you're both happy, how will your lives converge? And the answer is almost not at all. 
you know, you're going to be speaking Portuguese, they're going to be speaking Yanomamo, their lives are going to be completely different and far more similar to the lives of other Yanomamo. Um, and you're going to be, you'll be happier, but your life is still going to be Portuguese. Um, so in that sense, what could human behavioral genetics even be telling us about human behavior aside from a very, very narrow range of utility. And, and that's what I think the problem is with human behavioral genetics, um, is that it seems to be a field in which you can make a claim in, in, in which you explain one or two percent of variation um, and somehow get headlines from that. I don't think there's any other field of science in which you could explain one or two percent of a phenomenon and leave 98 percent of it explained and still get headlines. And the reason, of course, for that is that human behavioral genetics is very, very political. Um, and what it's really about is equality in society. Um, and, you know, and this goes into a, a, a different area, but the history of human genetics and the history of, of um, uh, uh, well, of, of, of uh, racial, of, of scientific racism, um, is really certainly in, in the U.S. Um, about how do we explain the differences between wealthy and poor people. Okay? In America, it was always, you know, whites and, and black slaves. Um, but in Europe, in the 1850s or so, um, you had some ideas coalescing about why, why are there rich and poor? And one group of answers is that the difference between rich and poor is entirely the product of history. It's the product of evil practices over many millennia um, that led to some people being haves, some people being have-nots, but organically they're interchangeable. You know, I'm not rich, but uh, I don't think Jeff Bezos is a better form of human being than I am. Okay. The alternative would be, and this comes out in the 1850s, when you've got this um, uh, change in European society in which the old hereditary aristocracy is being threatened by entrepreneurs, um, and the question is, do we really need an aristocracy? And the argument that's made by Arthur de Gobineau is, yes, we need an aristocracy. Why? Because the aristocracy is better than you are. And the reason that they're better than you are is that they are the bringers of civilization. So, so civilization is racially inscribed, because this is before there was any... I, formal ideas about genetics, but um, civilization is racially inscribed in the blood, there we go, that was, that was the term I was looking for, in the blood of the aristocrats. So it's something that's biological, and if you get rid of the, or, or if, if other people try and become aristocrats, that would be doomed for society. And these two poles, whether the difference between rich and poor is due to history or due to nature, okay, becomes the argument over every generation of subsequent scientists. So you got Francis Galton saying the difference between rich and poor has to do with intelligence and intelligence is hereditary. You've got the American geneticist a generation later, uh, uh, Charles Davenport saying the difference between rich and poor has to do with the gene for feeble-mindedness. Now, what's the gene for feeble-mindedness? They've just discovered Mendel's work, and Mendel's talking about peas being green or yellow, being short or tall, being wrinkled and round. So, following Mendel, there must be two kinds of people, right? Smart and feeble-minded. And poor people are simply people who have the gene for feeble-mindedness, the allele for feeble-mindedness. Um, and how do we recognize them? Well, they're poor, and they're not found in Northern Europe. Okay, that's, those are the people that have the feeble-mindedness allele. 
Um, a generation after that, you've got people talking about um, IQ and using pencil and paper tests, um, which must be genetically determined, even though a large component of all of those tests involves vocabulary. So you have to be testing the words people have been exposed to, uh, you know, if there's a vocabulary component. Um, and now, of course, we also know that there is a strong uh, element of discrimination, you know, that, that um, when, you, when you do IQ tests, for example, on um, blacks and whites in America, with uncontrolled data, you will generally find blacks scoring, on average, 10, 15 points lower than whites. Okay. But, of course, that's why we do controls in science. So you start controlling the data for things like uh, economic class and part of the country they live in um, and family size, and that gap shrinks immediately. And then you discover that there is also a cross-cultural component of just prejudice that affects your IQ score. So that Koreans tested in Japan do 15 points lower than Japanese. But you test Koreans and Japanese in America, and they score equally. So, and the difference there is the social climate, the, the, the climate of, of racism and oppression that, that they suffer from. Um, yet this is exactly what Charles Murray is still talking about in the bell curve, you know, this influential book from 1994, IQ tests, determine uh, your status in life, and they are rigidly genetic, um, and consequently, and, and you know, the political argument comes in, that consequently, um, we shouldn't have any social programs designed to help the poor, because the poor are poor for biological, not historical reasons, okay? And this is just as false today as it was a hundred years ago. But it's a very powerful tool for the rich. So consequently, what we need to do is be very, very vigilant as scientists to the social and political context in which we do our science. And unfortunately, you find in human behavioral genetics um, a lot of very, if you will, sloppy thinking um, that tends to be not very sensitive to either the history or the, the climate in which they're working. And again, um, you know, sometimes some results stand up, um, but most of them have a very, very short half-life. Um, I can remember, you know, back in the 90s, they were talking about a gene for homosexuality on XQ28. Um, that's crap. You know, it doesn't exist. Uh, and, and again, that was something that, oh, we're only explaining, I, I think the claim was they were explaining 5% of male homosexuality with that gene on XQ28 that doesn't even exist. And yet it was on the cover of every magazine, every newspaper, like it was actual news. And that's the kind of thing that I don't think makes science look good. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, another question. Do you think that we can talk about... Uh, a universal human nature, that is, that there are human traits uh, that are common across societies and cultures that we can refer to, because there's that, uh, there's also that concept that people use in anthropology, I guess that in mostly cultural anthropology that is human universal and there are some that have been identified like for example the fact that across all societies people build tools to um, to hunt to gather food to produce shelter they win children uh, I, I mean they they I, I think that marriage is also a human universal the vast majority of societies across history have been polygynous for example so do you think that it is correct to talk about a universal human nature in some way well let's get back to something you just said a universal is universal but when you start talking about the majority of societies being polygynous, mm -hmm. you know, an anthropologist immediately goes, well, what about the exceptions? I mean, if you're going to tell me that a human universal 
indicates that it's produced by biology, that it's something in our nature rather than in our culture. Right. Okay? Um, then what do you do about monogamous societies? Are they mutants? You know, what are they? Um, and, and that's why we tend to look, again, more to historical cultural explanations for human behavior because we focus on the diversity in human behavior. And, of course, with colonialism, you get a lot less diversity in human behavior um, than you had before colonialism um, and, and, and globalization. So uh, human diversity of behavior is being reduced before our eyes historically and when that happens it's going to look you know if your criterion is if it's universal then it's genetic but then it's nature um with globalization a lot more things are going to look that way than in fact are that way now i'm certainly willing to accept i mean there's certainly uh, uh in in human biology walking and talking is certainly what we evolved to do but you learn both of those things. You're not born doing them. And if you don't have a model to watch and to interact with doing that, as far as we can tell with either of those, you don't do them properly. So um, learning is very much a part of, of, of uh, human behavior. And l learning versus innate doesn't map onto biological versus cultural. Um, so um, I think we have to be very careful in, in what we're talking about when we start trying to invoke human universals as indicative of biology or of, of a biological basis. Um, I don't, you know, certain marriage is universal, um, but marriage has many diverse forms. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't know what it would even mean to say that marriage is a human universal and therefore it's biological or therefore it's genetic. Um, what does that mean about bachelors? What does that mean about, um, you know, all kinds of people who, who experience different forms of marriage or, or who, who uh, you know, you, you were talking about polygyny earlier. Um, what does that, you know, in a lot of societies, um, Polygyny is accepted if you can afford it, but most people can't afford it. So they're effectively monogamous, even though they're allowed to be polygynous. Um, you know, in ancient Rome, you were allowed one wife, but you were allowed legal concubines if you, you know if you could afford them. Does that count as polygynous, or does that count as monogamous? Um, so even the categories that we use to describe these these universals are very much culture-bound categories. And that's part of the problem, again, with psychologists doing these tabulations without a real feel for cultural variation and imposing Western normative ideas about behavior upon the rest of the world in, in terms of their categories. I mean, the, the classic example of that was in the 19th century, going out and looking for religion. Um, in the rest of the world. You know, what is your religion? Do you believe in God? Um, without recognizing that most people don't, don't separate out religion from the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, the ancient Greeks didn't have a word for religion. The, the, the word uh, religio comes from, from Latin. There was no Greek word for it. it not that they weren't religious. Um, it's that the, they didn't conceptualize separating religious ideas from other kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the things we have to be very, very careful about in any kind of cross-cultural examination is imposing our categories of society and our categories of thought upon the rest of the world that may not use those same categories. Mm -hmm. So do you think then, because we've been talking about uh, how science works basically and the kinds of uh, cultural materials or cultural beliefs that people bring to science while they're producing it, do you think that we can say that science instead of simply being uh, fact producing and reality description approach to knowledge 
that it is also value laden, at least to some extent. Oh, certainly. I mean, every, everything you know, everything we've been talking about is value laden science. When you talk about human biology, there there is no objective value free human biology. When we were talking about human nature, it's full of value. We were talking about human difference, it's full of value. Um, so again, um, it's very different from doing fruit fly biology or, or doing cow biology. Um, and I think that's part of why it's so much more interesting to do, to talk about human biology, because you have to recognize that there are these different aspects to it um, and that you can't just separate out the biology and imagine that you're being purely objective. Um, it's just a lot easier to be objective about Neptune than it is to be about your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So uh, let me just ask you one last question. Uh, and I, I took this from your book, Tales of X Apes, because at a certain point there you refer to the way by which people create a sort of mythology around the history of science. And uh, I'm going to quote you now uh, really quickly. You say the history of science is a history of ideas things and relationships. The history of discoverers is just a long-running soap opera. So, <laughs> so I mean, would you like to comment on that? Sure, you know, it, it, it comes out of my own, my own intellectual development. I, I um, was able to take uh, many, many years ago, I took a course in the history of genetics from a geneticist, and then a course in the history of genetics from a historian. And those are very, very different courses. Um, and the reason for it is that um, the history of science generally as taught by scientists is a history of a, a, a timeline of, of correct ideas leading up to the present. Um, and the history of science by the historian is includes the wrong ideas because they're interested in why did they have this idea if it was wrong. Um, and so one of the most fascinating things to me was that I didn't get any discussion of the eugenics movement in um, the class from the geneticist. Um, but the historian was very interested in the eugenics movement because it was a very um, mainstream scientific idea. We need to breed a better kind of citizen in the 1920s in the United States, and of course in Europe in the night. You know, imported those ideas in in the 30s. Um, but why didn't the geneticist talk about that in the class that the geneticist was teaching? And the answer is, well, it was wrong. We recognize that that was wrong, so we expunge it from the narrative that we create. We're just going to talk about the succession of correct ideas and the individuals that promoted them. And of course, the, what that means is that I, as the geneticist, could be in that story because I'm going to work and come up with some new ideas and maybe someday in the future I'll be in that lineage and they'll be including my name in this timeline of great discoveries. Whereas to the historian, um, you know, what is it about the time, what is it about the place that led the geneticists into this completely intellectual blind alley for so long um, uh, that they that, that they didn't even recognize was a blind alley. They thought they were being the great scientists uh, of the age, trying to remold society genetically. Um, the historian might ask, why is it that geneticists always want to run other people's lives? Yeah, which is an interesting question. Um, so, so in that sense, I think I would rather talk about history as historians do and talk about genetics as geneticists do. But talking about history as geneticists do, I think confuses the categories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this will be really my last question. With all of the limitations that we've talked about, I mean, with the cultural value limitations, with the cognitive limitations that we have, uh, what would you say is the best that an anthropological, an anthropologically developed science uh, can give us? 
Well, we're going to recognize that as human beings, our existence is, is biocultural. And, you know, we've been talking uh, about sort of separating the biology from the culture and talking about them individually. Um, and I think that that's a mistake. I think in the 21st century, we're going to be recognizing that human existence is biocultural. Um, it's, it's a mistake. Uh, it's it's a, a, a falsehood to try and explain human diversity or human behavioral and especially economic and political hierarchies biologically. That's a, you know, we don't do that, but we can talk about human variation bioculturally, um, especially in terms of um, how cultural differences and economic differences inscribe themselves on the body. We talk about differences in, in um, uh, lifespan um, that are uh, economically and, and uh, socially uh, influenced. I think that's um, how we're going to be talking about um, human variation and human evolution um, in the future. Uh, certainly in the history, certainly in, in human prehistory, um, the invention of cutting and the invention of burning were not so much biological inventions, although there was some biology, right? We have longer thumbs than chimpanzees do. Um, and the reason that chimpanzees don't cut things and don't burn things is that they don't have big enough brains or big enough thumbs for doing either of those. Um, so, again, this is what I mean by, by biocultural, and, and it's um, putting the biological and the cultural together but not in stupid and vulgar ways like scientists often do. We're going to do it in more sophisticated ways. Okay, great. So, Dr. Marx, let's end on that note. Uh, I will be leaving links to your books in the description box of the interview so that people can check them out. They are very interesting. Uh, before we go, are there any places on the Internet you would like to point to where people can find your work? Um, there are some, look me up on YouTube, I've got a few YouTube videos, um, some lovely videos um, for my books uh, that were, were done by my friend Natalia Reagan, um, and so they're on my YouTube page, um, and you can't look me up as Jonathan Marks, you have to look me up as Jonathan Marks, I think, anthropologist. Um, because there are a couple of other Jonathan Marxes out there. Um, but there are some, some, some nice videos that you can look up. Okay, great. So I will also include links to that in the description of the video and the podcast so that people can go and watch them. So Dr. Marx, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was a real pleasure to everyone and I, and I think that the conversation was really fascinating. So thank you. Nice talking to you. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've already done more than 300 interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would really need to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. I also have links to my PayPal account in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Forth, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Wittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard. My four producers is our web, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak. And finally, my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.